Brian Koberger's attorney has a conflict of interest. Is she going to get off the case? Guns don't harm people. Apparently dogs harm people. Friends and family are on the witness list for the government in the case of Alex Murdoch. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. Hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps simply by just typing in Crime Talk and Scott Reich. You'll definitely find it. It's worth it. You'll love it. Not only this episode, but all the previous episodes before that. All right, let's go ahead and support the people that support Crime Talk. Today, the sponsor is CrimeTalkSearch.com. Go to the link below, sign up for that background subscription service so you can do a background search on anyone here in the United States. And guess what? When you have that subscription, a subscription that you can cancel at any time, yes, it means that you can do as many searches as you want. And that report literally is generated while you wait. It is emailed to you so you can share it with others on the information that you find out. Hey, is this new person I'm dating on online that I met by some dating app? Is he the complete cat's meow or is he a complete dirtbag? Find out early. Is he married? Does he have property? Does he have judgments against him? Does he have a criminal record? Does he have to put himself on one of those public registries? Yes, you know the drill. Find out. Go to crimetalksearch.com. You'll be happy that you did. All right, let's go ahead and open the record for January 24th of 2023. And first on the docket, Brian Koberger's attorney. Oh, I think they've got a problem. So Brian Koberger's public defender has actively represented a parent of one of the four Moscow uh, stabbing victims that her client now, Brian Koberger, is accused of killing. That's right, Ann Taylor, the chief of the uh, public defender's office there, filed an attorney notice of withdrawal with the court for the parent on January 5th, the same day that Koberger made his first court appearance in Idaho there in Lata County. So what does that mean? It means that they obviously did a conflict search and realized that, oh my goodness, we've represented somebody who could be a potential witness in the case. I will explain. So this parent was previously sentenced on an unrelated misdemeanor charge. And in that case, as well as another where the parent faces two felony charges, the public defender's office withdrew in favor of a local criminal defense attorney unrelated to Taylor or the county's public defender's office, which is typical when there's a conflict, they appoint a private attorney. That just depends on the system that is set up in each state. Well, the new attorney is listed as, quote, paraphrasing, conflict public defender, end quote. That is a court-appointed counsel at state expense, but he is a private attorney when there's a conflict with the public defender's office. So clearly, there's a conflict. The question is, however, should the public defender get off of Koberger's case and not that of one of the Kernodals. Now, the only reason these criminal charges are uh, apparently being reported is to establish the connection between public defender Taylor and the family of the homicide victims. Now, let's face it, this is a high profile case and there's going to be issues of conflict of interest uh, immediately here at the beginning of the case. And anytime a former client is involved in a current representation, Every lawyer needs to evaluate potential conflicts. Now they're factually based and so the lawyer needs to decide whether there is an actual conflict. And when you have, when you do a conflicts check, when a new client comes and says, okay, this is the person, you look at all the witnesses on the list. If you have represented one of the witnesses on the list, 99.9% .9 of the time you have a conflict and you need to get off the case. You can't take it. Just saying, I think there's a big problem here, but we will sh shall continue. So obviously, you know, the four stabbing victims there at the University of Idaho were uh, Madison Bogan, she was a senior, Kayla Gonsalves, uh, she was a junior, Zaina Kernodal, um, also a junior, and uh, uh, Ethan uh, Chapin, who was a freshman. Now, the 
campus rental house where they died was about nine miles east of Washington State University in Pullman, where Koberger was a PhD student. And Koberger was arrested, obviously, at his parents' home in eastern Pennsylvania uh, on December 30th, ultimately extradited back to Idaho to face the uh, four counts of first degree murder, as well as a count of burglary, which is where somebody enters the dwelling of another with an intent to commit a crime therein. So public defender Taylor is just one of 13 public defenders in the Idaho uh, system there, the public defender's office that is qualified to lead a capital punishment case. She also is the only one in all of northern Idaho. Now, the prosecutors have yet to indicate whether they will seek the death penalty in the Koberger case. Um, and since 2000, the uh, public defender's office has represented the homicides victims, parents, off and on in several cases. Now, since uh, Public Defender Taylor took over the case, her office has defended the parent in four cases, including a misdemeanor from August of 2017, from which Taylor took over as the attorney of record in September of 2022. So this isn't a situation where she is just the office head and she, you know, her name appears on every pleading. She actively took over the case to represent somebody that is now a potential witness, particularly if there is a death penalty. You're going to want to try to talk to those family members to see if there is something uh, that is for mitigation purposes. And remember, the client is the one that holds the privilege. And so the issue becomes, will the attorney use something that they learned in the course of the previous representation for the benefit of the new client, but to the detriment of the old client? So it gets really weird. So Taylor's office has also represented another parent of the Moscow uh, homicides victim in four criminal cases since she became the public defender. In two cases, uh, records show that uh, Taylor was an inactive attorney. Uh, Taylor uh, has led the uh, public defender's office there since 2017, and she previously worked in the same office from 2004 to 2012. Then she shifted to private practice before returning back to be the head of the public defender's office there. Now, like every state, there are rules of professional conduct regarding a conflict of interest. And loyalty and independent judgment are essential elements in any lawyer relationship to a client. Its rule on conflict and current conflict states, concurrent conflicts of interest can arise from the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client, or a third person, or from the lawyer's own interest. Public defenders in Idaho also operate under a little more relaxed conflict rules because of the nature of the work to ensure that the defendants uh, receive adequate legal representation. Uh, now, beyond possible conflicts on the face, um, obviously to any practicing criminal defense attorneys is seeking to speak with family members, like we talked about, uh, and a possible sentencing to obtain their, you know, what is their position? Is it, should it be a life? Should it be death? anything along those lines. And effective representation in a capital case, if it's going to get to that penalty phase, there's going to be a lot of effort to try and talk to the family. So it makes it a little bit awkward. Now, here's the real catch. If Koberger thinks that there's a conflict, he can say, hey, this attorney has a conflict. I want a new attorney. And guess what? Since the public defender's office would be conflicted, he would get a privately paid attorney, similar to Lori Vallow in her particular case, and probably get two plus investigators and mitigation specialists and what have you. And I'm not saying Ms. Taylor, the public defender, is not qualified. She clearly is. But why would somebody risk a conflict on a potential death penalty case when the real simple remedy early on is to get him conflict-free counsel. She represented the previous clients before Mr. Koberger showed up, and they're the ones that the duty lies with in that particular situation. Uh, they should have filed a notice of conflict on Mr. Koberger's case and then appointed uh, new counsel. That's just in my humble opinion. Now, some people will say it doesn't matter. Um, you can Chinese wall off uh, Ms. Taylor 
from any sort of mitigation, anything having to do with the Kernodal family. Gets a little tricky indeed. You can also get a waiver from both sides saying after they meet with independent counsel that they're satisfied uh, of, of all the risks. But any one of the people that have previously been represented by this particular attorney, Ms. Taylor, could say, no, I'm not waiving anything. And everybody gets new attorneys. So it is a problem that could have been avoided by simply saying there was a conflict early on, or once we discovered it, we're going to withdraw. But they did everything they could early on to protect his rights. Now, We'll see. Hopefully this plays out sooner rather than later, and they don't wait until June 26th, which is the next date for the preliminary hearing. Next on the docket, a tragic case where guns don't harm people, dogs harm people. You can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. But a man was tragically shot and killed in a bizarre hunting accident where his dog allegedly pulled the trigger while they were driving. So an unidentified 32-year-old man uh, was driving in Wichita, Kansas, uh, and he was killed, according to the Summer County Sheriff's Office. And the hunting dog apparently stepped on the rifle while it was in the back seat, causing it to discharge in the direction of the owner of the dog who was driving the car. The police arrived and responded um, on the scene and they found the man in the front seat. They began to give CPR, but according to reports, he was pronounced deceased at the scene. And it's unclear whether the animal was harmed in any way, but the reality of it is, is that it is quite simple. Well, the dog did it. Next on the docket, Alex Murdoch. Now I know some people aren't that interested in the Alec Murdoch case, but as we are actually doing this show right now, they're taking evidence from a firearms expert regarding emotion and limine from the defense saying they shouldn't allow their ballistic experts to come in and testify. We should have a jury tomorrow because they have found 108 qualified jurors, which means these people are saying, based upon what I know thus far, I can be fair and impartial. And then the attorneys are going to get to conduct voir dire, which is a French term to means speak the truth. And then um, they'll winter that down and then we'll find their presumptive jury of 12 men or women, plus up to six alternates in this particular case. So we're getting close. Now, Buster Murdoch and other family members were on the uh, proposed witness list of potential people that could be called. A lot of it's going to depend on whether the court allows in a lot of the evidence that the prosecution wants to uh, bring in. If it's excluded, it's going to be a very, very quick uh, trial. So when uh, Judge Newman read the list of possible witnesses to prospective jurors to ensure that there were no prior connections with these potential witnesses, the state reported that in addition to Alex's son, Buster, the ex-attorney's brother, uh, John Marvin and uh, Randy Murdoch the fourth may testify as well. And for those of you who are not familiar with this case, Alex Murdoch is currently standing trial for killing his wife and son, Maggie and Paul Murdoch. And uh, they were the victims that were uh, fatally shot at the family's hunting lodge in Culleton County back on June 7th of 2021. Prosecutors concluded that Alex killed his wife and son last year to distract from mounting accusations that the former lawyer, disbarred lawyer, stole $9 million from clients and his uh, family's law firm. It's also believed to, uh, Alex has believed to have acted alone in the slains, according to the prosecution's theory, and that they uh, shot Maggie with a rifle and uh, Paul with a shotgun. He, however, states that Alec Murdoch claims, however, that he was driving away from the lodge an hour before he called 911 to go see his ailing mother, who's suffering from dementia. Then in September of 2021, months after Paul and Maggie slain, Alex suffered superficial head wounds when he allegedly had a former client, Curtis Smith, uh, shoot him in the head so his surviving son Buster could receive a $10 million insurance payout. A day before the shooting, Alex uh, was forced out of his family law firm amid allegations that he was stealing money. Two days after the apparent botched suicide, Alex announced that he was entering into uh, rehabilitation for drug treatment. Shortly thereafter, he was charged with insurance fraud in connection with the September 2021 suicide for hire plot and then released on bail. However, 
In October of 2021, Alex Murdoch was rearrested upon leaving a rehabilitation center in Florida for allegedly stealing a paltry $4.3 million from the estate of his former housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, who suffered a fall on his property in 2018. In that case, he was accused of stealing insurance payouts that were intended for Satterfield's family. Police plan to exhume her body amid an ongoing investigation regarding her death. And in addition to the murder charges, Alex faces more than 100 criminal counts related to fraud, which will be heard in a separate trial. And then finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. And who is our dumb criminal of the day? That's right, Grammy-winning rapper Young Thug and his racketeering co-defendants allegedly conducted a hand-to-hand -hand drug transaction during a court hearing that was captured on video. So the Fulton County, Georgia prosecutors say the alleged ex exchange was captured on the courtroom surveillance video camera on Wednesday. The rapper, whose real name is Jeffrey Lamar Williams and Khalif Adams are charged with conspiracy to violate the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act and participation in criminal street gang activity, among other charges. Now, according to the motion seeking clarification on the record, Adam stood up from his chair and walked unattended to Young Thug and gave him a Percocet. The motion says that Young Thug tried to conceal his hand under the table. Sheriff deputies took the painkiller and searched Adams, who resisted. He was taken to the Grady Memorial Hospital after he was uh, appeared to have ingested other items of contraband that he had on his person in an effort to obviously conceal um, the crimes there in the courtroom. That's right, committing crimes in the courtroom. During the search of Mr. Adams, the deputies found Percocet, marijuana, tobacco, and other contraband wrapped in plastic and food seasonings to make the odor of the marijuana less obvious. Percocet is the brand name for a drug that mixes oxycodone, uh, which is an opioid, and acetaminophen, which is the generic name for drugs such as Tylenol. Keith Adams, one of Young Thug's attorneys, stated that the estate is purposely misrepresenting and embellishing Wednesday's events. He said that Young Thug neither requested nor accepted the pill. Mr. Williams immediately gave it to the courtroom deputy that was directly in front of him because he got caught. Adams uh, said, an investigation cleared Young Thug of any wrongdoing, and the responsible party has been charged. And he said that the prosecutor's allegations were blatant fabrication and disappointing. So a superseding indictment did come down on August 5th in the Fulton County Superior Court, accusing old Young Thug of uh, nine charges, including participation in criminal street gang activity and violation of the Georgia Controlled Substance Act. He was also indicted on other charges, possession of firearm during the commission of a felony, and possession of a machine gun. Jury selection is ongoing. You gotta, you gotta love, you gotta love people that are so bold to commit crime in a courtroom when everybody's around, including the sheriff deputies who immediately saw what was going on. This, everyone acts like it's the first rodeo. That no one's ever seen any of this stuff take place. That's just the way it is. All right, young thug, you are a dumb criminal today. You can put that award right next to your Grammy. Congratulations. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you later this evening for our live program. Have a wonderful day, not just a great day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.